All right. Uh, welcome to lab number 14. I, I got to be honest with you. I can't believe we've done 14 of these things already. Uh, you know, I'm going to run out of material before too long here. I mean, you know, my hard drive is full. I can't learn anything new, so I've got to just use what I've got here. <laughs> so, but oh, it, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna keep going. I'll just keep making up stuff. But we'll be to lab 47 here before long. Uh, no, but <laughs> this is lab 14. Today we are going to cover uh, some dynamics, uh, primarily compressors and gates, things like that. This is going to be a really fundamental uh, little presentation here. This is relatively short. It's not that long, but I'm, I, I've given this, this kind of discussion and this kind of information to people many, many times, and I'm always amazed at how uh, readily they gravitate to that and just go, oh my gosh, I, I don't think I ever thought of it that way. That's, that, that helps me so much. So I, I hope it has that kind of impact uh, here for you guys as well. So we're going to talk about some dynamics and some of the dynamic workflows. Okay, so let's talk about dynamics processing. So let's uh, kind of set some boundaries and some definitions here, okay? So these are ratio ranges uh, to kind of define uh, whether you are in compression or into limiting, whether you're into expansion or into gating, right? And a lot of times that is really defined by the ratio that you're working with uh, on any of these processors. So, you know, for, for example, a compressor, and these are not hard lined rules here. These are, these are generalizations for sure. You could probably uh, look up three or four different definitions of where these ranges lie. Uh, this is just my experience, you know, and kind of based against some of the research I've always done. So compression is in one to one through eight to one ratio. Anything above eight to one, some people like to stop it at 10 to one, then you're into limiting, all right? You, that's gonna be considered limiting at that point. In expansion, same sort of thing, one to one, four to one, probably at the outside for expansion versus gating, which is gonna be four to one ratio and above, you know? So you can, you know, you, from that, you can just kind of discern, well, dramatic versus not as much dramatic or not as dramatic, right? You know, I mean, the, the, the settings are there, so. But it's a good way to kind of think of it to, to know and think sometimes when you're setting these things, well, well, do I want to use limiting or do I want to use compression here? Uh, and if you base that decision on ratio, a lot of times it'll help you navigate that a lot quicker. Uh, all kinds of variations, as you can imagine, on dynamics processors. We will not go, be going through all of them today by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but fair to say, especially in the world of digital uh, consoles, we have a ton of dynamics processors and dynamics processor types available to us now. I mean, the, the choices we have are really incredible at our disposal today. So things like DSers, obviously, which is actually, you know, a frequency dependent uh, compressor, uh, dynamic equalizers, multiband comp and limiter, brick wall limiters, uh, you know, for mastering and getting things to the web, et cetera, expanders, duckers, even frequency gates, which yeah, I'll tell you something, that's the one I wish we had more of in DSP. Now, I, if I could swing the camera around here, you would see it. And I don't want any giggles coming into the chat here over this, okay? But I still use this little Behringer noise gate that has a frequency gate in it on so many things, it's not even funny. It is just the greatest little box. And I haven't seen too many other companies actually make anything quite like this where you can actually set a frequency range. It works like a denoiser, right? Where you can set a frequency range and it will gate that frequency noise or frequency range down until it hits its, its own threshold. So, you know, for taking hiss or background noise out of microphones, et cetera, uh, it's just the best little device. Uh, but I have yet to see one in plug-in form uh, that I think competes with it, so. What's the name of that one? Hang on, I'll check. The one I have is called the Denoiser, the DNR2000. Now that thing's pretty old, I'm not gonna lie to you. That's, that's at least 20 plus years old. But man, I, you know, I'm not opposed to taking a, a few of those out with me. I mean, they just work fantastic. All right, so enough of that, let's carry on here. So let's talk about some dynamics terms now, because this can get a little uh, dicey at times. And you really kind of need to have this pretty clear in your head to be able to set these uh, devices up properly. So you kind of need to know these definitions. 
Uh, first one is obviously ratio. <clears throat> We're going to tunnel down on that here in just a minute and really discuss ratio and, and how it impacts these devices. Where's my man? Oops, Tim Harding. Stand by. There we go. Uh, the next one would be threshold, which is obviously setting a point in terms of level where the device is actually going to activate and kick in. Uh, again, we'll be discussing that in relatively deep terms here. This is one that always kind of freaks people out, and this term hysteresis. I mean, it sounds impressive, doesn't it? Hey, man, let's have a little more hysteresis on that. But really, it, you know, you can get kind of fooled by the big word. It really is just setting a second threshold, and it's primarily used in gating, right, where you'll set a threshold where the gate will open, but using hysteresis, you can actually set a second ratio where the gate will close again. Right, so it can make that where it's not near as choppy, not near as uh, you know, kind of clunky, unless that's what you're going for, obviously, which you could be. Uh, but it, it it's almost like a, a way to set a second release time, so it happens a lot more smoothly on the release time. So don't be scared off by it. It's it's a actually a very very helpful setting for uh, for gating. Uh, attack, obviously, this is the amount of time it takes uh, before the device kicks into play, right? This is, um, think of it, I like to think of it a little more like pre-delay, okay? It's like, it's a, in an amount of time before that device kicks into play. But there are ways to look at attack, uh, which I'll try to explain to you a little bit today. I don't have any really great graphical uh, explanation on this, but especially when you're talking about a compressor, you can use a, a mentality that is based in attack time to figure out how you're gonna frequency shape a given source depending on the attack time, because the attack time can dictate how you address high frequency in that source with your compression, right? So uh, th there is some thinking that goes along with that as well. Release is the amount of time it takes to come out of compression once it gets past threshold, once it gets out of threshold, once, it, once its release happens. Matter of fact, I, you know, I, any, anybody in here use Hulu? Yeah, a few people. Have you, have, I'm going to see if this is just me or just my provider or whatever here. Have you guys noticed how bad the compression or the limiting is on Hulu? It's unbelievable. I, I, I mean, it doesn't matter what channel I'm watching. It doesn't seem to anyway. It's about a second and a half attack time. So you'll get this burst of energy from whatever the program is, and then it'll come back down and settle down. And it'll stay there until the program stops and it'll release. And then the next time the signal comes in, it'll do the same thing. I was going to try to record it before this uh, session so you could hear it. it it's mind blowing how bad it is. I mean, that's, that's a situation where attack and release are not really optimized there, right? Uh, hold time is how, like for instance, on a noise gate, once it's open, how long it stays open before it puts the release parameters into play. Right. So if you had a gate that had a hold time of four seconds on it, but a release time of half a half a second, it would stay open for four seconds. And then if you're out of threshold, it would take that half a second uh, to come back out of it. All right. So it's just a hold time. Uh, the knee has to do with the shape uh, of the compression or the limiting, meaning uh, is it hard? Is it really strict? Is it kind of relaxed? Uh, you know, soft knee compression is uh, really <clears throat> really kind of desirable on vocals and things like that that have a lot of movement in them. DBX certainly made the soft knee um, appetizing to everybody with their use of that. Makeup gain. Uh, this is often a point of confusion. I see a lot of confusion about using makeup gain or not. Uh, so I've got, you know, a, a por portion of this is kind of dedicated to talking about makeup gain. But needless to say, especially with compression, you need to understand when to use makeup gain and maybe when not to use makeup gain. And then, of course, side chain. We, if you guys remember the earlier labs, we did an entire uh, lab on side chain usage. And uh, even on the device that you see on screen here, if, if you kind of look in uh, toward the lower third of that, you can see all the side chain capability you have to manipulate the side chain signal before you even use an external signal. You can high pass it, low pass it, create frequency boost, create frequency cut, all kinds of things to that side chain to be able to make that compressor react differently, to make the, the detector circuit react differently in the, in the compressor. So if you guys wanna see that, maybe I'll try to get over here and get some annotation in on that so you can see it, just as an example. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, here. 
So it's right here. So this is all um, pieces of that uh, compressor that you can manipulate the side chain on, right? You can pick peak and boost frequencies, high and low pass filters. You can turn on that, turn it on and off on the ex on the internal signal as well as an external signal into that side chain, right? All right. And then finally, look ahead, and obviously in the digital domain now, we have the ability, because we have latency involved and buffers involved, we can actually look ahead at the signal before it gets to the processor and, and have it do things to that, to that signal before it gets to the, the processor, right? Uh, we can actually impart some of that ahead of time, uh, which is really important for things like limiting, et cetera, especially in speaker protection, uh, things like that. All right, so let's go through some compressor types. Um, this is always a little mysterious for people, uh, and rightly so, because it has to do with the design topologies of uh, different kinds of compressors and dynamics uh, processors. So we're gonna talk about four different kinds of compressor types here. There are hybrids of this, there's all kinds of stuff out here, but I kind of put these into four kind of main piles to discuss these kind of uh, uh, kind of units, because uh, I think, you know, as you mature as an audio engineer, one of the things that happens to you uh, as you mature is that your database of devices starts to increase dramatically, you know, and as you start to think, okay, I need this input to kind of sound like this or react this way, you'll start to tie that to different types of devices, right? Because they, they, they react, they make a signal react, or they react differently to the signal than than each other, you know, all of these devices have a tendency to sound not similar. I mean, they, they will sound dramatically different depending on how you use them, okay? So let's start out with the, the, the modern compressor, we'll call it, even though the device I have up there is probably 30 years old. Uh, but this would be an example of a VCA detector circuit in this, uh, this style of unit, right? And uh, of course, the VCA in that situation offered very low distortion of the signal into the detector, so it worked really good. Uh, it's a very clean compressor if you've ever used a 160. It's actually kind of hard to get some aggression out of it without it feeling really, really over compressed. Uh, it does have a variable ratio that you can use on it. Fixed attack and release, though. You don't really have control over the attack and release parameters. Uh, but like I said, it just offers a really clean audio profile. Uh, does it, you wouldn't really use this kind of thing for color necessarily to your signal. Okay? Everybody good with that kind of... That kind of description there. Hang on, I gotta get my chat up here too. I mean, somebody's chatting me here. Stand by for me. There we go. All right, so since I'm so early in this, I'm sorry, I just saw the chats. Brian, did you get your question answered on hyst hysteresis and release? Uh, they, no, I did not. Could you go over that one more time? It's a little unclear on that. Yeah, it's really just two releases. Like there will be an actual release time, I, it, but it's there's also a hysteresis, which is a second kind of threshold of release. You can almost almost think of it like a knee for the release. It's very similar to how a knee on the attack works, but it works in release mode. So you know, I would encourage you. Probably your best bet is to get a compressor, or I mean, a uh, noise gate that has hysteresis on it. Uh, in plug-in form and play around with it on some drums. It'll, it'll become pretty apparent uh, quickly what it is doing. Okay, but just thanks. think of it, just be listening in the release half of the signal when you're adjusting it, and it'll start to make sense to you. Okay. Uh, FET compressors, our old buddies, the FET compressor, right? FET, field effect transistor. Uh, you know, these guys, you know, the FET was really kind of invented in solid state form to sound and act like a tube. You know, that was the, the idea behind FETs. And probably no more famous example of a FET compressor than 1176. Uh, you know, you have full um, ability to adjust attack and release time. You have some fixed ratios here. Uh, but this is a, you know, this is traditionally kind of a bright, kind of snappy punchy unit. It's, it's fantastic for drums, you know, percussion, anything like that. But that said, and I, this sounds like fluff, but it is just not fluff. I saw it and know that it happened. 
you know, I know sessions, I know recording sessions on famous records where they just ran every signal through an 1176, whether it was compressing or not, because they liked the sound of it on the output versus the input. So take that for what it's worth. They're an amazing unit. I have two of the original blackface LNs that you would have to kill me and burn my body to get away from me. Uh, but, you know, they're just a fantastic unit. They're definitely a centerpiece of pop and rock music for the last 50 years, that's for sure. All right, so, but uh, again, just kind of a, it's kind of emulating a tube and a, tube and a valve sound there with the FET. Uh, optic, opto compressors or optical really is what it's all about. And in these units, this is really an interesting device because it actually uses a photo cell and a lamp to create the compression, right? It, the, the photo cell is actually dictating uh, the side chain there, which is really interesting. And it's pretty slow, you know, and honestly, that's kind of what makes it work on certain things that it does. Like, I mean, like it's fan, great for vocals, uh, also great for mastering, uh, you know, all, things like that where you, where you need those kind of slow components to it to really kind of glue things together. Um, the thing to keep in mind with this unit uh, and the next one that we're going to look at, which is the variable mu, is that we don't have any control of ratio here, right? Ratio is actually a function of input level and compression. The, the, the deeper the compression, the higher the ratio, you know, so it's, there's two things in play there. And when I see guys use this unit a lot of times, especially if they're using it on instruments, I think that's where they fall short on it sometimes uh, because they're not realizing that as they go deeper into threshold on it, they're actually changing the ratio uh, that is being there, used there as well, even though they don't have control over it, right? So, you have to take that in conjunction. I'm going to give you an actual audio example of that today. Some of these things, like the difference between these topologies, would be very, very difficult to kind of show and demonstrate in this kind of setting. But I want to get these kind of, this kind of thinking in your head for when you're choosing the style of plugin. Because remember, all of the characteristics of these are being modeled in plugin. Even though those, though those aren't physical, physical devices, the concept and the response of the devices is being modeled after these devices. So the, the, the principles apply, okay? Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, let's go to variable mu. So variable mu, you know, these are some of the famous, I mean, the 760 is probably the most famous compressor on the planet, most, most coveted software on, or hardware on the planet for sure. Uh, this is all tube, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of valve gain reduction in this. Uh, again, there's, you have a ability to adjust attack and release, but they're kind of in fixed profiles. It's not a completely variable attack and release. You'll have some presets that you can use with it. Um, again, this is a kind of device you could use everywhere in, in the right setting. And I, I know recordings and stuff that have used this all over the place. But more often than not, I think it's probably used on vocals, guitars, and probably mix bus. You know, those are the, those are the big places. And, you know, kind of a way to think about this, I think, in these kind of devices, and when you have these slow attack and release profiles, is those kind of devices work really good to glue a mix together. Have you ever heard anybody talk about kind of gluing it all together or kind of making it dense sounding? That's what's happening there with those attack and release times. And probably no better example of it than the 760 here, okay? All right. So let's move on from there. Let's talk about some controls. Actually, before I go there, I'll ask for the questions. Anybody got any questions? Gear is asking, uh, the, the software version of the 1176, does it sound like the hardware thingy? <laughs> and I'll say it, I, it's in varying degrees I, it, for my ears, Gear. I, there are certain emulations of it that sound closer to the original uh, than others. And the other thing to remember is there's about three iterations of the 1176. There was the black base LN, there was the blue tag, and one other one, I can't, I can't remember what it was, but even they have different characteristics to them. And for my money, the, the thing that always made the 1176 kind of stand out from other compressors was the speed, the, the speed that you had uh, had the ability to get in the release time. Like if you wanted a really, really fast release time, which you, you can do, it, it's kind of a cool thing to do with 1176, which is this kind of medium slow attack time, but a really quick release time. And, you know, you can take a vocal and get it to really, really sit, you know, especially if you're using that in parallel with something. 
that works really, really good. But if I, if I saw one thing in the plugins that I don't think they ever got right, probably short of the UAD one, may, I might include the Waves one in there, but I know the UAD one is really good, is they got the release time right. So, you know, if you want to get that kind of, that kind of response out of it, you can. And then there's always this little bit of harmonic goodness that happens in that device. I think that's why the guys liked putting signal in it and just running through it. There was actually some harmonic plume that was happening there that they probably couldn't explain it. But just going, I like that better, you know, because it had a little more, a little more grit, a little more bite to it. So, uh, you know, that's my take on whether they go. You know, maybe that's a good, that's probably, that might be a good lab to do sometime is to kind of pull in, pull in some hardware pieces and try to do some comparisons to the software pieces and see how close we can get them, you know, look at them in FFT, et cetera. Think that'd be a good idea? Should we try that? Yeah, I, I thought it would be really interesting to do what, like what you did with the harmonic distortion of the other units uh, mm -hmm. a lab or two ago to do that with some hardware pieces. That would be amazing. Yeah, I'll see what I can pull in here. <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, space is tight in here. <laughs> I don't know if I can get any more racks in here. That'll be Lab 76. Lab 76. Yeah, look for it on your schedule. That's right. All right, let's jump into Dynamics Controls here. And uh, let's just talk about really understanding ratio and what it does, okay? Because this is, for my money, this is the key really to understanding all of it. You know, if you can really, really understand ratio and then even just watching input signals or something like that on your console and try to apply this mentality in terms of ratio and grabbing a setting for that input, this. To me, this is the key. And I, I used this for some, I put this together for some students that were just entering audio where this concept of even compression and ratio was just completely foreign to them. But I'm, I, again, I'm, I, I've been kind of amazed at how many guys actually gravitate to this and go, wow, that really helps me understand that. So I've, I've kind of come up with this little saying, right? So you might want to take a screenshot of this, whatever. And whenever you're thinking about what ratio should I use, put this little saying in your head and fill it in, right? So at a ratio of X to one, for every X dB over threshold my signal is, I will only see one dB increase of output. All right, just say that over, over to yourself a couple of times here and really try to process what that is saying because it's the key to understanding ratio. And we're gonna, we're gonna do some examples of it here, all right? I'll give you just a few seconds. You're gonna have more, more chances to get this. So I'm gonna, once I do this change here. All right, so let's, uh, all right, so let's take a look at a ratio of two to one and think about what that actually means in terms of output, right? At a ratio of two to one, for every two dB over threshold, my signal is, I will only see a one dB increase of output. So, just kind of doing the easy math at 4 dB over threshold, 2 dB of increase in output. 8 dB, blah, blah, blah. You kind of get the idea, right? Which, which should lead you to kind of understand and believe, okay, well, at 2 to 1, it's not going to be grabbing and wrangling my, my signal down to the ground. It's actually relatively subtle, right? It's just trading 2 for 1 on the output. Okay, everybody good there? Is it making sense? All right, well, let's see how much it makes sense to you here. And this is always the part that kind of drives it home here. So let's take a ratio of 20 to one. 21 to one would be what? Limiting, yes, limiting, okay, correct. At a ratio of 20 to one, for every 20 dB over threshold my signal is, I will only see one dB of increase in output, All right? So that's talking about something that is manhandling your signal there, right? And, you know, with limiting, let's start with system design first, that would be what you would want, right? If somebody does a mic drop or somebody, you know, somebody slams a microphone or somebody whacks a microphone with a drumstick or whatever it's going to be, where you might get this huge increase in signal that you were not prepared for, you don't want that, that increase to be seen on the output, right? You want it to protect all your components and your drivers, right? So, you know, you would want to use pretty high ratio, pretty quick attack. And again, we'll get, we'll get to talking about attack here and how that plays into this. 
Uh, but you would want to have that be in protect mode, right? Now, that's not to say that you can't use these kind of ratios at your input stage on vocals and guitars and things like that. But, you know, you've dramatically decreased the dynamic range of this signal now if it's going to be in limiting all the time, right? So you, you just, you got to be judicious. You got to got, kind of be clever with it, honestly, is the answer. But it, hopefully this will help you understand that at that high ratio, I'm going to keep pushing signal into it. I'm not going to get any more back out. I, you know, at 40 to, at 20 to one here, I could go 40 dB over threshold and only get a two dB increase in output, right? Is this helping you kind of visualize it? Is it helping you understand ratio a little better? Because you should be able to now, once you have this kind of thought process in your head, look at a signal while you're listening to it and kind of look at it and go, wow, okay, I just need to reduce that range by this much. You know, whenever he gets up there, I need it to pull it back you know, 4 dB, whatever, you know, you can kind of do the math there quickly in your head to think, yeah, I need about an eight to one ratio there, right? And then it's all about just tailoring an attack and release to make it work correctly. But this should help you get, to get the, the level versus the ratio part of it sorted out. All right, so let's uh, see, where do we go here? Yeah, so let's take a look at some kind of fabricated examples here. All right, so Here's a situation where our compressor is actually in circuit, right? But it's not in action. This is kind of that 1176 thing I was showing you earlier, right? So in this situation, you got th three looks at the meter here. Like on an actual device, you could do this, where you can look at input level versus threshold. You can look at gain reduction, meaning that middle meter, the meter, the, the deflection needle is going to move left, right, as... Uh, in, in order to show the amount of gain reduction that is happening. And then output level is pure output level, right? Uh, the dotted line represents uh, threshold here, I believe. Is that right? I believe it is, yes. So let's just walk through this example here, right? So the ratio is, uh, is preset to four to one, four to one. But our input level peaks at two dB below threshold. That's in that top VU up there. The solid line is the actual level the dotted line is the threshold, right? So we haven't even reached threshold yet. So in that situation, of course, it's gonna be a one-to-one -one pass through. The ratio is one-to-one -one at that point, right? Uh, it, for four dB, uh, minus four dB on the input is gonna give us minus four dB on the output, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go to another one now and let's actually get it in action now. So in this situation, we're still set at four to one, Remember that dotted line is dictating threshold there, but our input level is gonna peak up at zero. It's gonna pass threshold and peak up at zero. And notice our middle meter now has gone into gain reduction. It is showing us gain reduction of four dB, right? Well, we're at four to one. So that means we were gonna get a one dB increase in output, right? So three dB, and if we use makeup gain there, if we use makeup gain, 3 dB of makeup gain would result in 4 dB reduction in net dynamic range. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, using much higher ratios now. And I, this is where you, the rubber really kind of meets the road and you can, you know, you can see the effects of ratio uh, really in play here. So I'm gonna cover two examples for you here that use ratio, uh, extreme ratios, what I would consider extreme ratios anyway, of probably, you know, 20 to one or even higher, uh, you know, even on the limiter on the SXL console, gosh, you can go, what is the range you can go there? I think it's upwards of 50 to one. Let's take a look here. Yeah, you can go 100 to one. On, as a limiter on SXL. So you get some sense of what you could do here. All right, uh, so here we go. So let's, in this situation, we're thinking about limiting though uh, for protection, right? This is uh, protecting against, you know, mic drops or, you know, drum hits or something, you know, something that's going to have a really explosive level in it. And we kind of need to protect things downstream. So this is use of ratio for protection. Uh, this is something that might want to be the last thing in your chain. You know, we, we kind of talk about, you know, where do limiters need to reside before compression, after compression, where in the chain. In this situation, this might want to be something that is very far down in your chain or, or far along in your chain because you're going to use it for protection, right? So you would want to have it before the devices that you need to protect. 
So let's just go through the example here. Uh, in this situation, ratio is preset to 20 point one or 20 to one, excuse me. And, and our threshold is set at zero. So ratio of 20 to one, threshold set at zero dB, and our signal level, our nominal level, is around zero dB. It's just operating in an optimized fashion around zero dB. But we get a huge swing in level. Uh, like I said, a mic drop. Something's happened with a microphone or an input to make it go crazy. Somebody's unplugged a cable, whatever it's going to be. And we get this huge swing of input level uh, into our channel, right? In this case, we're going to just make it a 20 dB swing to make the math easy. Well, of course, that's going to result in a 20 dB reduction of gain, right? That big level is going to come in and the compressor is going to go, nope, going to turn it down for you at 20 to 1. And of course, at 20 to 1, what that's also going to mean is that the output will have only jumped up 1 dB. If that's a 20 dB spike, we're sitting at 20 to 1 uh, with a nominal operating level with threshold right around nominal. We get that 20 dB uh, peak. The output's only going to increase 1 dB. That's, that's our formula. Remember when we did the little saying of, you know, at X dB, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is where this works, right? So as you can see there, we've had a huge swing, but yet the output has not really changed much in level uh, and protected the devices downstream. Now, obviously, you don't want to have that kind of level happening all the time here unless you're going to use it to affect, right, in a meaningful way, which is what we're going to talk about next here. All right, so let's take a look at using uh, this style of limiting for effect, uh, which you could definitely do. This is not an uncommon workflow at all. Uh, you see this all the time in recording, uh, especially for metal and rock and pop records, for sure you, you might see this kind of work. Whether it's on the source or it's in parallel uh, to a source, a lightly compressed source, you, you would see this kind of thing. And this is using limiting to effect, right? Uh, meaning you're going to put it into limiting and keep it there uh, throughout the use of it, all right? So in this situation, we're using that high ratio again, 20 to 1. Could be higher if you want to do it. I think, uh, gosh, even... You know, you know, 41, 51, 61, if the limiter will do it, right? So um, so in this situation, though, to keep the math simple, we're going to do it at 20 to 1. So let's, let's go through the, the scenario here. So in this situation, we have a 20 to 1 ratio, but we're going to set the threshold now at minus 20, right? Threshold at minus 20, not at 0. And we're going to have a nominal operating level of 0 dB. So as soon as the signal is on and operating, we're already 20 dB over threshold. And of course, that's going to result in 20 dB of gain reduction, right? It's going to push that signal down 20 dB. Now, here's where makeup gain comes into play, right? We have to use the makeup gain to get that signal back up where we can hear it, right? We don't want it to be down 20 dB and try to mix it there. We need to add that 20 dB of gain reduction back in makeup gain so that we hear this greatly reduced dynamic range signal, right? This signal that literally has no dynamic range now, and we're going to bring it up and use it wherever we want to use it. Now, of course, you have to be careful with this in live sound. You can get away with this in the studio, but getting away with this in live sound is dicey because remember what we do in this situation. The lowest level signals are now essentially even with the highest level signals. And in live sound for a vocal is the best example. For live sound, all of the surrounding noise, cymbals, drums, guitars, PA, is now just as loud as the vocal in that, um, in that signal uh, when it's limited like this. So you have to be careful. You, you probably can't get away with using this except for under some pretty extreme uh, circumstances around that microphone. So you can try it. Just be careful with it. Probably works best in this situation in live sound using this as a parallel element, as a malt element, back to an original vocal or guitar or whatever it's going to be. All right, so be careful with it. But it does absolutely work. All right, let's talk makeup gain. Uh, when and where to apply makeup gain. So um, here's kind of the discussion. And for this discussion, we're going to define dynamic range as the distance between the peak signal and the lowest signal in our program, right? So in this situation, I've kind of faked it up here. Uh, and you can see the peak level uh, are the top level versus the lowest level. So we're going to consider that our dynamic range, whatever that is. doesn't really matter at this point. Okay, so maybe in this signal we've kind of said, well, you know, see this really high peaky part here? That's the part I need to get turned down a little bit uh, to make my signal kind of set because there's, 
kind of, you know, there's too much distance between that and the other signals here. It's, it's making it where I can't get the volume right on this particular thing. Maybe it's a vocal, right? So I'm going to set my threshold here. That's kind of where I want this vocal to sit. So <clears throat> anything that is above that threshold is obviously going to impart uh, compression at our whatever ratio that we're set at, right? So this is the amount of gain reduction that we have in play now. So once we set threshold there, the signal has gone above that threshold and the entire signal has been turned down by this much, right? That's our amount of gain reduction, right? So without incorporating any makeup gain now, what is happening is the signal is going above threshold and it's turning the entire signal down, right? It's just stopping, um, not considering ratio, it's not really stopping, but given ratio, it's gonna hit those high points and turn the entire signal down. It's gonna, it's gonna stop it from going any higher which means those lower levels are gonna, gonna stay down as well. So the idea with this kind of compression is, you know, you wanna, you wanna use makeup gain here, right? You wanna get the overall signal back up to its level, uh, and we wanna actually decrease the dynamic range of this entire signal so that the distance between the high points and the low points is smaller, right? So uh, let's take a look at this. So we're gonna use the makeup gain here now and notice that once we do that, the distance between the, the high point and the low point is now smaller, right? We've decreased the entire dynamic range. Now, this is kind of an important piece of the conversation because I, I, I've had many a talk with um, guys that are relatively new to compression and you know, they have this mindset of, I'm gonna use compression to turn things down, right? To actually, you know, catch the peaks and just level things out in my signal, right? And it, it's, it's a valid mindset. You can actually do it that way uh, where, you know, the, the compression ratio is just going to turn things down that peak over a given period of uh, time. But what you end up heading toward that, there, if you have a, a pretty big significant peak between your average level and the peaks, is you end up using much higher ratios to get those two things to just kind of level out, you know, and more often than not, when guys do that, they will turn up the fader, right? And they'll get to the point where it's like, well, hang on, why am I having to turn up the fader so much to get my average level up? It's because they haven't used makeup gain there, right? So what you want to do is be able to kind of, in my opinion, have this compression in place, have it operating, and take it in or out of circuit and not really notice any overall difference in volume change, right? And once you achieve that, the, the important part to remember is you actually have reduced the dynamic range. You've actually made the average level louder. That, that ultimately is what compression does. It doesn't turn things down. It makes the average level louder of any signal or any mix, right? It's raising the average level. It's raising the distance between the low signal and the high signal. And if you get clever with this, you can use this in some really, really meaningful ways. Uh, I, 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 it's part of the reason that I have a mix bus, you know, compression and limiting set up on my mix bus so that if I'm mixing in an environment that is really loud, where I got loud people, loud building, uh, you know, just a lot of ambient noise, obviously if people are going to be able to hear the loudest components of my mix, but the things that are down pretty far, they're going to have trouble hearing in that environment because they're going to be competing with the audience noise, all kinds of other noises, right? Whereas if I can take that mix and shrink that together a little bit, if I can take the, uh, you know, decrease the actual dynamic range of the mix, now the bottom elements of that mix are up competing now with the ambient noise, the audience, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, you can, you can actually get it where people, even in a loud crowd, can actually hear the lower parts of your mix if you handle that correctly. Now, you want to be careful with it because as soon as they sit down and stop making noise, you're going to have this really kind of compressed feeling mix sitting in front of them, you might need to release it back down. You know, you might need to kind of do your own kind of damn dynamic move with that. But the idea is that when we're using compression, especially, but end limiting, we are decreasing the dynamic range of the signal overall, right? That's what we're trying to achieve there. Okay. So can I use compression to kind of turn things down? Yeah, I, I can, but you know, it's going to be much harder to get your average levels up at that point. It's not, it really is just an application uh, in that situation. You know, I, I'll give you an example where you might want to do that. <clears throat> so, and this, this is more of a side chain example, right? 
So if I took my vocal and I fed it into the side chain of my music mix so that every time the vocal hit a certain threshold, it would turn down my music mix a little bit, right? I would not want to be using makeup gain there on the mix, right? I would want to let that thing pump and breathe there a little bit. I'm not trying to re raise the average level of the mix there. I'm trying to use that vocal to push the music away so the vocal will reveal. And then when the vocal's gone, the music comes back up to its normal level. It's almost like ducking there, but when you're using a compression compressor to do it, it's, it's certainly smoother and a little, little easier to manage in that scenario, right? But in that situation, the compressor is on the mix and you would not use the makeup gain there. You're not trying to decrease the dynamic range of the mix. You are trying to have it follow the dynamic range of the vocal, right? Is that making sense to you guys? I know, I, like I said, this is, some of this stuff is hard to talk through and demonstrate really, uh, but that's the, that's the piece of it you need to understand with in terms of makeup gain. You buying into it? Somebody give me an amen or a hallelujah or a please turn your mic on, one of those two. All right, let's take a look at, uh, let's see what we get next. Yeah, let's take a look at expanding dynamic range, you know, using an expander per se, which, you know, by all accounts is a noise gate. You know, noise gate, expansion, remember the only really difference is the ratio that is being used uh, to those uh, kind of devices. So th this is obviously a drum track. We're looking at a drum, probably a, probably a bass drum and a snare drum, something like that. So let's take a look at how this might work. So in this situation, we're going, to we're going to define the dynamic range in this sense as the distance between the signal we want and the distance between the signal we don't want, right? The one we want to hear, the one we don't want to hear. That's going to be our dynamic range de definition here. And then <clears throat> we're going to set the threshold near that, um, the noise element, the piece that we don't want in there, right? We, we want it to be just above that so that it doesn't open the processor, only the main signal opens the processor, right? This is just setting up a noise gate like we always do. But here's the thing to keep in mind, right? Attack and hold release, uh, attack hold and release settings are in play here. We can set up for how long that gate stays open, how quick it opens, how quick it releases back to the signal to get something that sounds natural, right? That's what we would wanna do there, unless the unnatural sound is part of what we want there. And I, I'll take this moment just to maybe lay some groundwork for some things we're going to cover possibly in the future here uh, because I, I know it's coming. You know, in digital before too long, you're going to have the ability to do mix, be able to mix input signal and output signal, even with a noise gate, right? Or even an equalizer where you can say, I want to blend the gated sound with the ungated sound, things like that. Or you could actually create Parallel gating. This is not uncommon either. I've seen this many, many times in the studio, used it myself, where you might have a drum sound that has a normal gate on it, but then you're going to add a parallel version of that gate with very quick attack, very quick release, and create something that sounds very choppy, right? <clears throat> and once you do that and bring it in in parallel, the overall impact of your drum kit gets very uh, impulsive, right? It's a lot of impulse a lot of attack to it. It actually works really good uh, for creating bright, punchy drums to be able to in, add in some parallel extreme gating, right? It works fantastic. So something to think about here in terms of when you would set it this way. All right, so then finally, the depth or the ratio of the gate that we use is going to dictate our new expanded dynamic range, right? So once we put that depth in, it's going to push that signal farther down when it's below threshold, right? So our new dynamic range now has been expanded, right? It's like you're just making the noise, what we define as the noise in this signal, go farther away when my signal is not there, right? And, you know, again, I hate to get, make generalizations like this, but I, I, I just see it too often. This is probably the most mismanaged thing I see when people are setting up gates on drums is the depth. They're trying to, make the, trying to make the signal go too far away. They're trying to make it like an on-off switch or, or make it where I only ever hear bass drum and never, ever hear the snare drum. And it, it, you're going to have a really, really hard time when you do these 80 dB depths on here to get any kind of attack and release that will work and sound even remotely normal, right? So 
remember, you, you know, you don't have to go super deep on this to get really, really good effect out of it. I mean, six, eight, 10, probably 12 dB at the most, I would think, uh, for doing drum gating. I mean, if you've got a really, really noisy microphone that's got a lot of background bleed in it, you're going to be challenged with it anyway. Uh, but, you know, six, eight, 10, 12, somewhere in there, and your attack and release characteristics will work really, really well for you. Okay. All right, let's see, where do we go from here? Yeah, so that's your resultant expansion of dynamic range there. And you know, the place where this works good, and I don't see a lot of guys use this in uh, live sound, but I use it all the time, is doing uh, minor expansion on vocals, right? Everybody always seems to want to gravitate toward gating vocals. And it's like, you, man, you're, cha I mean, you're so challenged to get that to actually work. You know, it just, it, it just never sounds right. It all, you always hear these kind of gates flipping open and flying open. Whereas if you just go to a really shallow ratio, two to one, three to one, with about four, maybe six dB of depth on it, where that, you know, that vocal will just come back a little bit when he's not singing, he or she is not singing on it, right? If you add that up over a number of inputs, maybe you've got, you know, four backing vocalists, well, you've now knocked down... 32 dB of noise in your mix, just with that little bit of ratio, that little bit of duck in, the, in those microphones, right? And it'll sound natural. Even if they're off mic and kind of singing, you're still going to hear it. It may not be exactly the level you want, but it won't be this choppy noise gate opening up, right? So think expansion there, where you want to just expand that dynamic range of that vocal, get some distance between the vocal and the background noise. Don't try to make it 80 dB, just make it a good, you know, four, three, four, six dB, somewhere around there. Klaus is using PSE. What is PSE, Klaus? Can you explain there? I mean, that's essentially what's happening with the Neve device, you know, the, the Neve hardware device where, where they're doing the vocal stuff. That's some very clever expansion that's going on there. Oh, it, oh that is the Neve device, the PSE? No, I believe it's a Waves. Uh, is that the Waves? Oh, that's singer? right. That's Waves, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. I but know you, I use you, the uh, the um, uh, the their Cedar emulator. I use it on uh, bus outputs for yeah. corporates a lot. Yeah, any of the Cedar, the um, Dugan stuff. That's all very clever expansion that is going on there, right? Very tricky, clever expansion. Really, really good device. If you've ever used one on a set of lavaliers, you'll never go back. That is for certain. I've been using Dugans for, I don't know, 20 years plus now. I've used every version of them. I've met Dan a few times and basically I just bow. I uh, yeah, me it. too, man. I just go, you know, <laughs> this, this is one of them we just can't get up, give up. I mean, you know. Uh, all right. So let's, uh, let's just talk through a couple of signal flow considerations here because this is kind of important as well. Um, let's talk compressors and limiters first. So should I, can I use limiting and compression on a single source, right? And of course the answer is yes, there's no limitations to what we can do here. But the question becomes what order do I use them in, right? And I'm gonna give you an audio example of this here to kind of drive this home. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea you know, is to possibly take out peak information with the limiter to allow the compressor to be more smooth in what it does, right? So, you know, the combination of limiting and compression is actually really, really, let me just emphasize, really powerful in live sound. You know, the ability to have these units back to back and use them is an absolute lifesaver. An absolute lifesaver. If you haven't done this or considered this in the past, I would, <laughs> I would consider, I, I would urge you to do so, right? Uh, especially if you're going to use a compressor on your signal that is one of these multi-ratio compressors, or you know, where it's where the deeper you get into the compressor, the higher the ratio. That's that is a situation where that kind of unit is really hard to use in an optimized fashion if you've got a signal that is going all over the place at the input stage. You know, it's just going to be really difficult to use there. So uh, what you'd want to do is set that up where. If, like in the example I'm going to give you where the singer is singing very, very quietly, where you can still possibly even have some compression on that, but once they go high and loud, the limiter catches it at a high ratio, 
and keeps it there so the compressor can still keep working, right? Uh, I, I, another great example of this, it, used to, it took me forever to kind of kind of have this duh light bulb moment with Petty was that he would, on acoustic guitar, especially if he had a strumming part, he, he might play eights or something and it was pretty low amplitude, right? I mean, he would just be playing along as a very light strummer, very light strummer. It's part of his sound, actually. <clears throat> but at the end of the song, he would hold the guitar up and I mean, just be wailing on it, you know? So if you had any any sense of setting the signal when he was playing it in the song and got it up in the mix, as soon as he went there, everything bottomed out. The, I mean, it would take out the bus limiter. It was so much signal in it, you know? So of course, you know, the, the idea was, okay, I've got to get a limiter in front of his compression here, something with a really high ratio to catch it when he goes there and bring it back down. But when he's not playing that, the limiter's out of play, right? It's just in compression at that point. So, you know, th that's the thing. And I would just add to it before I show you the example, I've, I've become so enamored with this that I, I just, it, like if I'm going and doing a show where I don't know the vocalist or I haven't had any time with the vocalist, there's a limiter and a compressor on every vocal channel. And it's, you know, I, I can kind of get a sense of where it needs to be set after, you know, eight bars, 10 bars of music generally. Uh, but it's, it's a good way to catch you and keep you from fighting through some of these issues when you're, when you're setting it. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go to the example here. Let me just do this. Okay, yeah, here we go. All right. So I'm going to go here. Let's see if I can get you over here. Stand by for me. I've got to do a little bit of operation here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is from some Patti LaBelle stuff I recorded uh, live. And as you can imagine, she has an unbelievable uh, dynamic range. I mean, so impressive. Uh, and she just handles it so well. But this is a situation where I actually use the onboard dynamics on the console, on the SXL, as the limiter. And then I put an LA2 after that uh, for compression. All right, so I'll, I'll let you just kind of see it here. You, um, let me get this in here. So that's the limiter, and I'll give you the settings on. I'm going to have to read them off because I don't think I can show them on screen there. Uh, so that is that is this is going to be about 18 to one on the limiter. Uh, relatively fast attack, so about a just under just right at a millisecond here. And then about uh, half a second of release time on the limiter. I could probably, I, just knowing this vocal, I, I could probably go faster on the release time as well. Because we don't necessarily want it to hang in limiting, right? We just want it to take down all these gargantuan peaks here and keep the compressor in play. Uh, but to start it here, oh, and I, I'm sorry, I'll show you the, the compressor, the LA-2 as well. Sorry, this is going to be a little clunky to show this. So there's the LA-2A. You can see it's set into compression. Uh, so I'm going to try to get it where you, I'm going to play this through a couple times and let you look at it without any limiting uh, on it and let you watch this compressor and see if you can tell the difference here. I'll give you a couple different looks of this. All right, so that's out. And you guys might have to give me a little read on the volume that is coming to you here. All right, so here we go, I think. So this is without the limiter. Could be a little louder. So. All right, here we go with the compression in now. That I've heard of once in a lullaby. So Now, 
Now, if you get, if you kind of get your ears wrapped around it, you can kind of hear the ratio changing in that as it goes there, right? So I'll let you go on that one one more time, and then we'll come back and put the limiting in in front of it and listen to what it does to it. Mm, there's a lie that I've heard of once in a lullaby. So Okay, so this time I'm going to put the limiting in in front of it. At least I think I am. There we go. All right, so now watch the difference in how the LA2 reacts now. Mm, there's a lie that I've heard of once in a lullaby. So Right? Everybody hearing the difference there? Well, it's really noticeable in my earphones. I got to tell you that. It just, you know, it just takes all that kind of rolling of frequency when it's just the compressor and gets it evened out and then puts the compression on it. It, it just works fantastic. I'll give you another view of it here so you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. Let's look at, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go here. This is another way to kind of read what's happening here. Yeah, so this is the group. So I'm going to start it again without the limiting in and just watch meter here. I believe this is output meter here. So especially watch the peak component, which is kind of hard to read, but it's the yellow piece of the signal as you see it there. So And here's with the limiter now. Watch the average level. That's where it really shows. I mean, meter-wise, even, it just sits right in the sweet spot down there, you know, about minus, minus 12 of that group there. Uh, so it, it works really, really good here. Is that making sense to everybody? Yes. I mean, you know, we're, we're in a very rich time processing-wise here, guys, where you can, you have, I mean, you got a limiter on every channel. If, <laughs> if you want to set it up, you know, you should just never be yearning for the hardware to do this. You know, you have it at your disposal now. And if you pick two topologies that work really good together, meaning, I, you know, I'll, I'll put on my Avid hat for a second. The limiter on this console is so freaking transparent, it's not even funny. I mean, you can have some really extreme limiting going on on an input strip on this console and be pressed to hear it really doing its thing, you know, other than just looking at the meter and going, oh, my gosh. But then follow that up with one of these, you know, like a variable mu device or an LA2, something that is a really – smooth compression, especially on a vocal like this, you know, I mean, it just, it's money, man. I mean, it works so, so good. You know. Everybody got that? Kind of following along there? Is it making sense? I hope so. Right, let's go back to this. All right, so yes, uh, obviously using limiting and compression, you might want to do it that way. I haven't seen very mis many situations or I haven't experienced very many situations where I would put the limiting after the compression. That, that ne really never seemed to make sense to me. I, I'm open to anybody that wants to bring it up and, and say, hey, yeah, you know, let, let's do it there. I guess the only time maybe I might see this uh, would be maybe uh, in almost like what we're doing today with streaming, we're limiting, you might want to also have some limiting in the last part of your signal chain to fit within a LUFS target or something like that for streaming, or, you know, 
especially if you're going to go compression and EQ, brighten things up and have that drive into the PA system. Well, you might want some limiting there just to try to take care of some of that brightness, those brightness peaks going into the PA. So in those situations, maybe, but at the input side, I, I very rarely see myself or I very rarely see anybody else using limiting after the compression. It's usually the other way. I would say even, even guys that are doing the, you know, the 20 to one meter laid over 1176 thing, usually that is in conjunction in parallel with another vocal that is compressed, you know? So in that situation, you've kind of separated the two things here. We're doing the limiting, then we're feeding the compressor in the parallel mode. We're compressing and then limiting like crazy and adding the two together. Right, so a little different topology there, so to speak, uh, where one is not necessarily feeding the other. You could, in that situation, make the compressed feed the limiter, I guess. But uh, you know, you, you just gotta you gotta kind of you know play around with that a little bit and see what works for your situation. I would just I, you know I would think I would advise you be careful if you're going to do the twenty to one thing, the really squash thing in parallel in live sound, because remember what happens there, right? We are dramatically raising the average level. What is down in the average level in live sound, especially in a vocal mic? It's stage bleed, it's cymbals, it's PA, all the bleed into that microphone, you've now brought it right up level uh, with, the, with the voice, right? So be very careful there. In the studio, it's a different situation. All the surrounding noise in the vocal is the $2,000 a day studio, right? We might want to bring that up closer to the vocal, but in, in live, you got to be really, really careful with it. You can get into some serious game before feedback issues there if you're not careful. All right. Uh, should I EQ before or after my compressor limiter? Right. And really this is all about just what you want. I, I hate to be this bland about it. What you want to happen here. Right. Uh, because if we, let's, let's take, Remember that signal, if we, let me see how I want to say this. If we, if we EQ the signal before it goes to the compressor, we have effectively EQ'd the side chain as well, right? Because unless you dictate something differently, that input signal is just going to be tapped and sent directly to the side chain, to the detector circuit. It's automatic. It happens. You don't have to do anything. But if we EQ the signal and then send it to the compressor, we've EQ'd both of those signals. So if I, you know, where it might help you to do that, uh, and usually processors are set up this way, is you would have a high pass filter on your input and that would be pre your insert point, right? And that's probably a good thing. That way you don't have all this rumble, all this mess down on, on the bottom end of the microphone that is dictating the detector circuit, right? So in that situation, you are kind of EQing before compression. You know, you're taking out some of this extraneous noise. Maybe you're going to high pass or low pass it down as well. But I would submit to you this. If you're going to do correction equalization, right, correction, because equalization is level, right? If you're going to do correction and then compress it, you've, you've essentially neutralized that EQ, right? You've taken those levels and just kind of flattened them right back out again. Right. So, you know, you, you got to really kind of decide, okay, what am I going to do here? Because the other thing that comes along with that, if you're going to EQ before your compressor is now your equalization is affecting your threshold, right? As you brighten things, as you cut things, threshold's not going to act the same now because there's not the same amount of signal there. Right. So typically, typically, I, and I would say way, way more often than not high pass, low pass filter, previous to, to going into compression. But equalization for me, actual channel equalization, especially if it's corrective, happens after the equalizer. That's the, that's the way I want it to happen, right? So uh, it, it requires that you dig in a little bit on your digital console and find out what the channel path is on your system, and especially for things like S6L, you know, where the plugins come in, versus where the channel strip EQs come in. You know, that can, that can kind of dictate what's going on there sometimes. So you want to be careful there. This is obviously especially true if we're talking about noise gates and expanders, right? If we EQ before we go to the gate, now as we change equalization on that input, on that drum per se, we've now changed the threshold and possibly even the attack and release characteristics of that gate. So again, more often than not, you're going to want to equalize after the gate. 
So in terms of compression and gating and then equalization, what's the preferred order? I, I think for me, typically I like to use compression first, then gate, then equalize. I want the dynamics of that signal to be pretty well sorted out before I hit the threshold of a gate and try to predict what's going on there. Those two are, are virtually interchangeable. You could probably get away with it either way where you could gate first and then compress as well. Totally fine there. I just find that when I'm doing it, that's, that typically is where I end up a lot of times. Uh, but I, again, no hard and fast rules. You, you just got to realize the consequences of what you're doing. If you're going to equalize pre-dynamics, you know, then remember equalization is affecting threshold, is affecting detector circuit. Okay, that's kind of the, that would be the hard and fast rule there. Okay, is that helping you guys out at all? Does that demystify any of it? You know, it's a lot easier now in digital. We don't have to pull out channel strips and move jumpers to get it to show up in the right spot anymore. You know, we don't have to do that anymore. It's kind of cool. All right, let's see what do we got next. I, you know, I figured this might as well, we might as well just do a little bit of parallel drum compression here just to kind of talk about the different ways to do it and just kind of review this a little bit. We'll finish with this. It, this will go pretty quick here. So I always try to take the time to demonstrate to you guys, you know, that you can do parallel compression at any level of audio that you're doing here. You don't have to have a high-end console to do it. It's all about the routing and the configuration of it. Uh, and I won't go into the long drawn out story here. Obviously this is a little Behringer console here, but I actually did this exact scheme once at a show and kind of freaked some people out that, you know, they had never heard their console quite sound like this. <laughs> so I always use this console as the example. It's like, look, you can do this anywhere. It's all about how you do it. So we're going to talk today. I want to make sure everybody's up to speed on the concept of New York parallel compression. Uh, this is the one that I think is probably the most frequently, frequently used for drums. And it involves this. It involves a compressor and an equalizer. Okay. So notice, uh, the running order here, we're going to actually take an auxiliary bus out to the compressor, compressor out to the equalizer, and return it to a channel, right? That's exactly how we're going to do it. That way, any of those drum channels, we can send into that chain and have one fader that represents the parallel compression. Easy peasy. So simple to do in analog, so much more difficult to do in digital. From there, part of the secret of this sound is being able to send both the compressed drums and the uncompressed drums to not only your reverb processor, but also your subwoofers. When you can send both of these signals to your subwoofers, now you're really, really cooking, right? So the idea would be we're going to take another aux bus out and we're going to take both of those signals to the, the processor and create an effects return. And Likewise, we would take another aux bus out and create a sub drive if we were driving subs on an aux, whatever, whatever you need to do to get both of those signals to your subwoofer system, okay? So that's as simple as it can kind of get in terms of New York compression. Uh, you know, you, you're typically going to work, you know, fairly, I'll, I'll say average slow attacks and uh, you know, medium slow releases on that compressor. Re remember what we're trying to do with parallel compression is just, again, raise the RMS level of the drum kit up, right? We want to get the average level, both tonally and in terms of level up uh, in our system. And, you know, even doing something like this on this little Behringer console, you know, the, the, the main response from everybody was, I've never heard the drums be that loud through our PA system. And yet we still had tons of headroom in the console. You know, they, they couldn't quite get their heads around what we were doing there. So, that's the other benefit, right? If we raise average level, we also raise perceived headroom in the console. All right, so let's take a look at how we would do this in digital. And I'm going to show you a couple different methods here. Uh, this is the method I've been using for quite a while now. I, I switched over to this, I don't know, probably eight, 10 years ago, once I kind of figured out how to do it. And it's using um, a bridge channel, which I believe we've talked about in the past in some of the labs to be able to be able to do the proper time alignment of these sources, right? So in this situation, you can see I got a kick, snare, and tom. I'll just state here, not to make a rule, just for me, this is, this is how I generally work. I typically only parallel compress the drums themselves. I, I won't parallel compress hi-hats and overheads and things like that. It is typically just the drums. So that's why you see a kick, snare, and toms there. And I'll take an aux bus out uh, to some time adjusters to be able to create a bridge 
back to a pair of inputs. This is a pair of stereo inputs here. So one of those stereo inputs, let me move this so I can see here. One of these uh, stereo inputs is uh, the processed version of the kick, snare, and toms. The other is just a pass-through. It's just a bridge. And we have to do this so we can time align these two paths, right? So I got somebody just showing up here. Some latecomers today. All right, so we have to do that time alignment process. If you're curious about that, go and watch the earlier labs, probably lab two and three, uh, to get some idea of you know, when and how you do this. But safe to say it's there for that. And the idea is that we're going to process one of those paths and not process the other. And then we're going to send them to a single subgroup. So in that situation, both the, the kick, snare, and toms processed, kick, snare, and toms bridged are going to a single subgroup, which is also assigned to our master bus. Notice the, the input channels of kick, snare, and toms go nowhere in terms of busing, right? They are not bused uh, to an, uh, a master bus other than uh, these bridge and processed channels, okay? Now, the kind of the cool thing with this is, obviously I'm using an aux bus to do this and bring it back down into these two channels. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can send these up back into auxes again, right? If I wanna do, uh, you know, to a plug-in for reverb, et cetera, I can send the kick, snare, and toms from the auxiliary to that processor and create an effects return. I can also use another aux to send it out to the subs if I'm driving them, driving them separately, right? Uh, so it gives you a lot of control there and a lot of, it's very easy to get both those paths there. All right, so uh, I'm gonna show you this, the next one as well and then it, we can come back and review if you need to, but I'm gonna let you listen to both of these. They're virtually identical sounding, uh, but they're just different ways of doing the same thing, all right? So the key here is just remember, you have to create the bridge in order to be able to create the alignment for those paths, okay? So the next one, uh, this one is using two subgroups uh, to do the parallel compression as opposed to uh, two uh, input returns, two parallel returns. So in this situation, we're going to have uh, one subgroup that's got processing on it, uh, one that doesn't. Uh, we're going to take all of our kick, snare, toms, whatever, and send that to one group that has all the processing on it. And then we're going to send all the rest of the drum inputs to the other subgroup and we're gonna add these two things together. Now there's, uh, depending on the console that you're on, uh, kind of dictates how you're gonna get these two groups in alignment. Uh, we've talked about this in, in the past as well. Again, I'll refer back to labs two and three where, you know, on the venue console, you can create a forced align channel, which is a, a channel that is assigned uh, to the two subgroups as well as the left right bus. And it will force the alignment of those two groups to happen. If you don't have that capability on your console, you can just duplicate up uh, the processing on that second subgroup and put it in bypass. And that way the path length of those two groups is the same. So it's expensive in terms of processing, obviously, but sometimes you might have to do that. Or if you have the ability to do channel delay on those groups, you can get them in alignment that way as well. All right. But this works, you know, just as good. The challenge here, uh, and I'll, I'll say this specifically for S6L right now, because we don't have bus to bus workflow uh, right now in this console, is that it, if we had bus to bus, then I could just take those two subgroups, send them to the auxes that are doing effects and subs, and Bob's your uncle, you're on your way. Uh, I, could, uh, I could also do that with auxiliary masters if I wanted to do it, you know, as opposed to using groups, uh, but it requires a bus to bus workflow to do that. In this situation, uh, and this is the way I used to do it in the early days of Venue, you would just create matrices to get these two subgroup signals to your effects processing and to your subwoofers, right? In that situation, you would, you would just use the matrices to drive to them and then return uh, the effects back to channels and just add them to that subgroup, right? You just have to be careful which subgroup you're sending. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a listen at both of these. I can think I can do this pretty quick here. And let me pull up, let's do this. Let's go. Let's go here. Let's see if we can get the camera up. Oh, let's see here. 
And again, you guys will need to let me know on the level if the levels are right here. Okay, so here's the drum kit. Uh, the first example I'll show you uh, will be uh, that first uh, parallel set that I showed you, which is uh, where we have uh, go aux bus out into the plugin and return it to two channels, two actual input channels, and then assign those as well as the other drums, meaning cymbals, overheads, hi hats, to a, a single drum group. So we have a single auxiliary, I mean a single submaster for the drums, right? No effects processing here. We're just going to talk about the drums and the effects. I'll highlight each one of these for you. Let's see here. How's the level on that? Is that okay for everybody? It could be louder. Uh, it's lower than your voice. Yeah, it could be a little louder. That looks pretty hot on the Luffs meter here. Okay, so in this situation, I'm just gonna turn off the compressed. And then back in the kick and snare. So what I want you to kind of take a look at here is right here. Try to watch this level. Okay? Because that's without the compressed in it now. And we're going to put the, the spank set of kicks and toms in there. I want you to watch what happens to that level. So the RMS portion of that signal has stayed right where it was, but the drums feel two or three times louder, right? Obviously more peak information in there, and that, I think that's a function of the EQ that's on it. All right, so here, next, we're going to go to the one that is done on the groups. So I've got two subgroups set up here. This is all drums, and then this is the spanked version of the kicks and and toms added in at the group level here. Right? Let's see how I got it here. Yeah, sorry, a little different volume there, but you can tell. So in this situation, watch, try to watch this meter. Actually, this one here. I'll put my finger right there. So as you can see, right, we, we get a big jump in apparent volume with very little loss in headroom, right? That's the goal of that, that mindset there, especially for drums, especially in live sound. Uh, but, you know, that, that same mentality would work in the studio as well, where you're working in a very confined, you know, meter set, a very confined level. You know, you can use that very effectively to get, to get that window to sit right where you want it to sit, you know. What do you think? Any questions? Anything you want me to cover? Happy to do it. I have a question. Come on. While we're on, on the subject of uh, fabulous routing there. Uh, what exactly are you adding or changing with uh, your Pultec EQ on the drum group? Sure. Uh, let me just pull it up here. Stand by for me. I need to be 
here. Yeah, here we go. So, Holtec on the drum group. And, you know, this is similar to what I do on the, um, on the drums themselves. It's a, a little bit like that. Uh, let me get to it here. So this is, I'm um, using Spank on this, or Smack. Here's the Poltec. So uh, there's a little bit of boost in the bottom end and a little bit of cut. There's like that boost cut thing that you can do with the Poltec at 60, which creates a little bit of a dip around 500. Uh, and then some boost at 5K and then some attenuation at 20K. So that's happening to try to keep maybe some cymbal bleed, I'm guessing is why I did that in there. These are all just leftover settings from where I was at one point. I just kind of pulled them up this morning. But yeah, this, is, this would not be uncommon to what I'm doing there. I'm, you know, I think normally, I'm not sure why this is set there. I would normally have this be broad. Oh, wait a minute. Are you guys seeing that? You're not seeing that. Hang on. Um, we're looking at the Phoenix. Yeah, hang on one second. Oh, I'm, I see what's going on here. I'm down in the wrong part of the window. Sorry. Here we go. There we go. So that's, that is on there. And as I was saying, you know, I got some 60 boost uh, and some 60 cut. And that net, in terms of net response, creates a little dip around 500 in the drum kit. Uh, I got a pretty good boost. Maybe this seems a little extreme even for me at 5K and then some attenuation at 20K here. And again, the, these create a, a similar thing. Those two filters kind of work in conjunction with each other to create that top. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of the secret of, secret sauce of that unit, right? Thank you. Of course, of course. We'll take a look at this. I mean, that might be good to do it. You know, I mentioned earlier, uh, Michael, I see your hand raised. I'll be right with you. Uh, talked about earlier of doing some examination of hardware versus plug-in. You know, we could do that in FFT and look at, you know, an actual Poltec versus a plug-in Poltec and see what the filter shapes look like. And things like that. Maybe I'll try to pull that together in a lab. That'll be a little... It might take me a little time to pull together, but I bet I could do that. Okay. Uh, Michael, go ahead, man. You got a question? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier you were going to talk about makeup gain a little bit, unless I missed it, uh, which is entirely possible. I've had a couple of distractions today. Yeah, I think you missed it. There was one entire section on makeup gain there. So I'll, I'll defer you yeah, to the – I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look it up once you post this. I'm yeah, sorry. look it up on the playback. You build. Yep. Find it. Yep. yep. All righty. Well, that actually went way longer than I thought. You know, I, you know I, I think the conclusion that we can all draw from me doing labs is that I have a terrible concept of how long something's going to take. So when I say, yeah, I probably need about a half hour for line check, you can bet that's going to be an hour and a half. All right. That's, that's what we can learn from these labs right now. <laughs> all right, my friends. Any other questions there before we uh, head on out of here? Oh, that was a great one today. That was, that was fun. Thank you. Hope that helps you a little bit. Hope to get you thinking about it a little bit. Like I say, man, we have all this processing available to us on these consoles now, man. Use it, but use it wisely, right? That is the key. That is the key. Nothing wrong with having all those tools, but man, use it wisely, right? Okay. On that note, I will let you all go. I am heading for some lunch. Look for the replay. I should have the replay uh, posted sometime tonight or early morning. And again, thank you all for showing up. I, I'm really amazed at how many people are coming to these things. So thank you for showing. Very, very appreciated. Tell your family and friends. And guys, we will see you next time. Thanks, thank Robert. You, Robert. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.